It's rugged, wild and beautiful. Cornwall's coastline is a huge part of its identity. Cornwall has more miles of coast and is battered by bigger waves than any English county. These dramatic cliffs may seem rock solid, but they're increasingly under attack from climate change. I'm Emma Hazeldine and this is my climate story. I'm a runner and I love running in wild and beautiful places and I've been running stretches of the southwest coast path for years. But over that time I've noticed the impact of extreme weather more and more, with the coast path often rerouted due to cliff falls. Now I'm running the Cornish coast from one end to another because I want to find out how climate change is going to affect our seaside communities and what they are doing to face up to the challenges coming their way. One of these days that's going to fall and I'm just hoping I'm not going to be standing as near to it as I am now <laughs> because it will come right down here. It devastates me because when my daughter's my age, what she sees now is not going to be here. We're trying to keep up with sea level rise, which is always an ongoing battle and always will be, I'm afraid. It may not seem like much so far, but it's accelerating. I've just arrived in Kingsand, which in 2014 was hit by the kind of devastating storms that are likely to hit the Cornish coast more and more in the future. The devastation here hit the headlines. Whilst the physical damage to the buildings has been repaired, painful memories remain just below the surface. We knew that there had been storms, so we were concerned and we'd experienced four or five you know, pretty bad storms, but nothing like we experienced on the 14th of February 2014, nothing quite like that. We had a 10-foot wall outside our house, so we didn't expect the wave to ever come right through the window. It felt like a tsunami. All of a sudden, we were up to our knees in water. I remember Solomon's homework floating around, and I remember running on glass. There were flashbacks, horrible dreams, and it was just that constant, is it going to happen again? We lost everything near enough, all completely wrecked. We had to start again. I felt very vulnerable about being homeless, really. That was the biggest fear. We were moving from one holiday let to another for three months. That was really, really hard. I could not believe the power of the water. When it didn't just knock the door off its hinges, it took the whole door frame out. The whole thing came out. I went up the hallway on my back underwater and then hit my head on the end wall. I'm surprised it was only me that was hurt, actually, the family. We were all quite shocked and traumatised, especially the youngest, Josh. It took him a long, long time to get over that. He was so traumatised that even on a calm day like today where he could hear the waves on the beach, he was concerned that there was a storm coming. And it was one of the reasons we left the village. Nearly every property that was badly affected, the people who owned them in 2014 are not there now. That in itself speaks volumes. Cornwall has always been hit by huge storms, but as our planet warms, changes happening thousands of miles away mean we are in for much worse. As the ice melts, the sea levels are rising. We have already seen about 20 centimetres of sea level rise. 20 centimetres can seem like quite a small amount if we're looking at the entire ocean. But the fact that the sea level is 20 centimetres higher means that it will be a certain amount closer into the coast. And that means that when you have things like storm surges, they're going to come much higher up. Already we have a lot of places which are really taking a battering when we see violent storms coming in. And so every bit of sea level rise is going to make a huge difference. But what's happening today isn't the first time people here have had to cope with sea level rise. On the Isles of Scilly, off Cornwall's far western tip, the tide falls low enough a few times a year to reveal the impact it had on people in the past. You can see here there is a line of stone stretching out onto the sand behind me, and this appears to be a prehistoric field boundary. It's likely that there are far more of these structures, walls and hut circles and so on, in the areas between the islands which are completely covered by the sea. The Isles of Scilly were joined to the mainland during the last ice age and eight or nine thousand years ago there was still one island. It's been a steady process of sea level rise which has led to the layout of the islands that we have today and they are basically the hilltops from the single landmass that was here at the end of the last ice age. The highest point is only about 55 metres above sea level so it doesn't need a lot of sea level rise for, for the islands to, to disappear. But the steady rise that inundated our ancestors' homes has sped up in recent years. Today, Jonathan Smith is watching his coastal farm disappear before his eyes. I used to drive my tractor along this path here, 
I've now had to cut a hole in the hedge because actually you will be driving over the cliff because the coast has eroded back so much. That's all going to come undone soon. Yeah, and here's some fresh stuff just come off. This is right on the boundary of my farm here. It's such a fragile thing here where you've got these hedges literally right on the edge of the coast. If these go, then there's no wind protection. Every year this is getting nibbled away at. And in the 2014 storm, there was so much that went from here, several feet. It looked absolutely horrific after the storm. It's quite a difficult feeling. There's a lot of heritage to this farm. I've put a lot into it, 20 years of work. And potentially within the next 25 years, it could be unusable. Steve Watt is one of the team working on a new two-year programme called Climate Adaptation Silly to tackle the impacts of future sea level rise and storms. He says one of the key threats to future life on the islands could actually be access to drinking water. The volume of water that sometimes comes across us from the sea is quite profound because we are very low-lying. Virtually 99% of the people on St Mary's are dependent on the water supply from the pumping station which is just beyond the lake. You can see with a big gale it would be quite vulnerable, quite easy to break through the sand dunes which have offered a pretty good natural protection so far to our water supply which is just a few yards of further side. Once the salt water gets into a fresh water supply that's it. So clearly that's quite dangerous for us because we all require water to live. The idea is to prevent storm surges going over the top and affecting our water supply. The £3.7 million project will safeguard the island's drinking water by shoring up coastal sand dunes, as well as harvesting rainwater from reefs. It will also safeguard vital services in low-lying areas, but the island faces an even bigger threat. There's about 1,600 people all together on St Mary's, and most of them live in Hughtown. The capital is built on a narrow isthmus, which is only 300 metres across, and built on sand, with sea on either side of it. We get terrific storms through the winter uh, every year. It's not uncommon to see the sea in Hugh Street, which is outside the co-op. It's the only supermarket we have. Two thirds of the accommodation would be inundated if there was a storm surge and it became regular. There is an argument that you should let nature take its course, but if we did that, <laughs> we'd be doomed. I think the inevitable will probably come about in hundreds of years' time. So in the meantime, what can we do? We can protect it as much as possible, and that's what we're going to do. Raising sand dunes, reinforcing the sea defences by rock armour. Back on the mainland, the situation might seem less serious, but a dramatic three-day collapse here on the Lizard Peninsula was one of the increasingly common cliff falls along the southwest coast path. The 630-mile path is the UK's longest national trail and earns Cornwall over £200 million a year in tourist income. The coast is always a changing environment. The difficulty that we have at the moment is that that changing environment is changing more rapidly than it has done previously. Most of the coast path is at risk in some shape or form. What we're finding is we're getting more frequent storms and we're also getting more severe weather events in general. We're getting hotter and drier summers and we're getting wetter winters. It's where we're getting a lot of rainfall happening in a short period of time. And that in itself makes cliff erosion happen more quickly than just the storms undermining the cliffs. So it's been attacked from both sides. Back in 2013, the costs on maintaining the, the 630 miles averaged out at about £1,000 a mile. Over the past five years, those costs have started to go up and up, and we're now seeing the costs for ourselves at around about £1,600 a mile. So that's quite a significant increase in quite a short period of time. And it's not just the path itself that's affected. Some of Cornwall's most important heritage and tourist attractions are right on the edge too. Kadrivi is one of the most visited outdoor sites in the southwest within the National Trust ownership. It sees about 600,000 visitors a year, so it's massively important for people to access. There used to be various access points down to the beach from here up to the car park, but over the last 10 years, lots of them have just become totally inaccessible. They've totally washed out and that they are just sheer now. The access at the moment is along a single track road just along the edge of the cliffs here. That cliff edge has got closer and closer to the road and the southwest coast path. It could go imminently, but really anything from now up to five years, but probably not longer than that. The road is on borrowed time. 
but we're looking at realigning the road back inland enough to give us at least another 80, 100 years life. And the life of that car park is pretty well at its end. It's just not viable now for us to continue providing that access to that point. So we're looking at how we can also move the car park inland. We're talking definitely into hundreds and thousands of pounds to carry out all of that work. The National Trust owns about 10% of the UK shoreline, so as coastal erosion picks up pace, so does the financial burden. With the coastal erosion and suddenly losing sections out of the blue, then the Trust has to try and find that money. There's lots of good drivers all around the country, so it is trying to work out which ones are the highest priority. There is another, less famous piece of Cornish heritage underneath this old pier in Newlyn, and it's been quietly measuring our tides and sea level for over 100 years. The continuous readings from the Newlyn tidal gauge are used to work out the heights above sea level of all the UK's landmarks, and they show that Newlyn, Cornwall's biggest fishing port, faces serious issues in future if nothing is done to protect it, along with the other towns in Mounts Bay. Here in Mounts Bay, we've got Marrows Iron at the eastern end and we've got Penzance and Newlyn at the western end. And this area in the middle is mainly protecting the transport infrastructure, which is the railway coming into Penzance and then the helicopter and the boats going into the Isles of Scilly beyond that. It's really important infrastructure. We've recently put in some rock armour to protect the back shore, which is basically what the railway line is sitting on. If that breaches or erodes, then we lose a lot of the transport links, not just the railway line, but the A30, properties, residential and commercial behind it. We put this in 2019, and to be honest, I don't think the railway would have lasted the winter of 2020 if we hadn't had this in. So I think we got it in just in time. And this is really a stopgap, a short-term solution, which should hopefully secure the railway line over the next couple of decades, just giving us a bit of breathing space to find something a little bit more sustainable long-term. What we'd really like to do here is what's called sandscaping. And it's something that's been developed in the Netherlands very successfully. And the idea would be to bring in probably about 1.3 million tonnes of sand dredged offshore somewhere, and it's placed in the bay, and then you let the natural currents distribute it. It'll work with sea level rise, with the natural currents, build up that natural coastal defence for the bay probably provide about 30 or 40 years protection to the whole area and then it might need to be done again but that's 30 or 40 years down the line. But there are many hurdles to jump to make this 30 million pound scheme a reality. This would be only the second time that sandscaping has been used in the UK. The first time was to protect an oil terminal in Norfolk. They had plenty of money there to invest in it and they've moved very quickly. Unfortunately we've moved a little bit more slowly because there's so many things to take into account. One of the main impacts was the eelgrass in the bay, which is very important ecologically, very important for drawing down carbon dioxide. And whatever we do, we don't want to upset that natural ecosystem. Even if we stopped all carbon emissions today, we're still gonna see sea level rise because we're seeing the impact of the last 50 years of carbon emissions just starting to come through now. There's a lag with sea level rise and it's not gonna turn around, it's not gonna go back down. It's just we need to come up a little bit more slowly to give us a bit of time to react. Plans being made for Mounts Bay are based on something that most of us won't even have heard of, the shoreline management plan. Every inch of Cornwall's coastline has been mapped and placed into one of three different categories. The shoreline management plan has various policies, such as no active intervention, it's not quite the same as doing nothing. If you intervene, sometimes it's a bad thing and will cause knock-on effects elsewhere. So there's often very good environmental reasons for for no active intervention. Hold the line is mainly where you've got a lot of infrastructure such as ports and harbours. There's no guarantee economically you can afford to hold the line. So we'll hold the line as long as we can, but we need to bear in mind that that is not sustainable everywhere in the longer term and to think about how our coast is going to develop in the future and be ready for it. And then there's managed realignment, which is working with nature. And it could be going further inland and managing that process as the sea takes over the land, or it could be pushing it outwards. Hold the Line covers less than 1% of the Cornish coastline, but one place that hopes to stand firm against the rising sea is Loo, home to over 5,000 people and notoriously the most flooded town in the UK. At the moment, flooding occurs on about eight occasions in the year. It could be as high as 12, but by 2080, we reckon that that would be about 180 times a year, so almost once every other day. 
The history of Lou is one where the town centre has been built on mining waste and that's quite a, a gravelly, porous material. The walls themselves allow seawater to come through it, but they're also penetrated by pipes from gullies in the road that directly discharge the rainwater into the river. As the tides come up, what actually we find is that water is coming up through the gullies and into the town. There's over 300 businesses here, along with over 200 residential premises. They never know quite when that flooding is going to occur, and millions of pounds have been spent over the last 15 years just repairing flood damage. It's quite sad that we sort of held ransom to the water. Sometimes it's been, over the years, it's been quite freaky and it's happened very quickly. And we try and prepare, put boards in. We've had sandbags and we tell the customers, bring the wellies. <laughs> you know, expect a little to paddle a little bit. We've had a couple of very bad floods and then replaced carpets overnight and then reopen the next day, which has surprised people. But that's how our community in town are like. We don't let it beat us, really. Now, plans have been put forward for the most ambitious and expensive flood defence scheme in the whole of Cornwall. Costing at least £75 million, the aim would be to keep Lou a viable town, tourist destination, fishing port and transport hub. If approved, work could get underway as soon as 2024. What we're looking at is a tidal barrier system where we have floodgates on the outside of the harbour. Coupled with that, we would need a flood cut-off wall to make sure that the flood doesn't bypass the barrier and go underground and up into the town. And then alongside of that, we need an area outside of the mouth of the river where boats can take refuge. So we're looking there at some breakwaters. What we're looking at for a scheme like this is really buying the town time to adapt to rising sea levels. Complex schemes like this are an option in very few places and that's not just because of the cost. Research has demonstrated that we should focus on protecting our natural defences like these sand dunes rather than trying to hold back the sea with engineered structures. Europe's leading team of storm chasers working out of Plymouth use high-tech equipment such as laser scanners to monitor exactly what happens to our beaches during storms. Changes to the coast are mainly done during big storms and in order to predict how coastlines respond to rising sea level we have to understand what actually happens during a storm. Very difficult to measure that to capture a storm. So if you have an uninhabited beach with a pristine dune system behind it and no roads, no coastal infrastructure, then a bit of coastal erosion is not a problem. In Cornwall we have lots of places like here, like Morgan Port, which is very pretty, but we've got development just behind the dunes here. And that automatically makes the coastline at risk. If the road wasn't there, then these zones could gradually shift and then we wouldn't need these blocks of granite to fix the dunes. Rising sea level wants to push the beaches and the dunes back. And if that movement is, is, is stopped by things like this or seawalls, then the beach will get squeezed against that coastal structure and will get narrower and narrower. And then eventually the beaches will disappear underwater. That's something we should avoid at all costs. Dunes in a way represent a, a piggy bank for the beach to be tapped into during a storm. So you can sort of imagine that if there's a storm starts to erode the beach under the dunes, some of that dune sand will actually end up on the beach and protects the beach. And then in the summer, the reverse happens. The, the winds will take the sand from the beach and blow it back into the dunes. So there's really this interaction between the beach and the dune system that's really important to keep both systems healthy, actually. We've identified 40 locations around Cornwall where we've got real issues over the sustainability of these coastal sand dunes. We're going to take a long, hard look at our dune systems and then decide what we need to do to make them more sustainable. If the dunes are constrained, then we lose them, and they are important coastal defences. Allowing the dunes to shift naturally might mean sacrificing some properties to the sand. Making decisions like this is no easy job, and it needs community buy-in, but in most places these difficult conversations haven't even started. Most communities are just turning their backs or covering their eyes and pretending that there's not an issue. I'd say the majority of Cornwall is leaving it too late. But one place bucking this trend is Bude, where the community is starting to face up to what is coming. You get a taste of how bad things are as you approach the town. This section of the coast paths had to be permanently relocated behind these houses. We are at the sharp edge of climate change. You don't feel it in Sheffield in quite the same way. The Atlantic comes straight in and hits us full on here. It's great for the surf, it's a spectacular shoreline, but it makes us really, really vulnerable to sea level rise and to the other impacts of climate change, the storms, the wind, the greater rainfall. The impact of a storm surge that we currently experience once in 200 years will, with sea level rise, become an annual event. 
These things that we think of as happening, you know, not in our lifetimes will be happening every year. But there's a large part of the town and it's kind of prime property that is going to, if nothing is done, flood. Nobody is saying nothing is going to be done, but it is a question of being prepared to sit down now and to start making those decisions because we don't have that much time. If you sit around and wait, then it's never going to happen. And the money's always going to go to the people who stand up and put their hands up and make a fuss about it. It's not going to happen to the people who sit at home waiting for it to, to be delivered to them. Rob and his team are keen for the town to start planning how it will adapt to the inevitable sea level rise and to become carbon neutral by 2030. But to be successful, these ambitious aims need community support. The core of it will be a climate assembly. So that means bringing people from right across the community who are asked to come to, to weekly meetings. They'll be paid for their time and start talking about what's important to us as a community. What do we value about it in terms of the things that make life worth living here and, and then what we want to do about preserving those. You know, when you look at Bude on a map, we're isolated, but this isolation has made us really, really resilient and has led to a community spirit and we need to build that into our responses to climate change. Just outside town, the community is already rallying to save a much-loved historic Coast Guard shelter in one of the UK's first projects to save a building threatened by climate change. The storm tower has already been moved inland once before, 140 years ago, but the advance of the sea is relentless. It's a huge part of our skyline. Lots of people come up here and get proposed and Lots of people have their ashes scattered here. It means a lot to people as a landmark as well. It's beautiful sunsets. It's now only in some places three metres away from the edge. We've lost a metre a year since 2017. If we don't move the tower next year, the land around it and the stability of it will become too unsafe for us to actually do any work any longer. So we've been crowdfunding to actually save the tower and move it 100 metres inland to hopefully preserve it for another 100 years if we can. The estimate is about 390 to maybe 400,000 to do this. We've actually having to dismantle the tower brick by brick, one by one, and then we're going to have to move it by hand across to the new site. 400,000 is a lot of money. I love the tower, but it's just a tiny little thing at the end of the day, and the bigger impacts and problems that we're going to have are huge. But even as Bude is starting to face up to some difficult questions about its future, in other places, people are still acting like the future isn't going to happen. You go into estate agents in Cornwall, and the highest prices are either clifftop sea views or, or riverside areas, the two places where we really shouldn't be building. An example of what not to do would be to build apartments right on the beach. And they did this at Carver's Bay. They basically built a couple of apartment blocks right on the beach. And as they were building it, they were already building coastal defences to protect the apartments. Well, that's just madness. We should not be building on the beach. We should not be building on the eroding cliff tops. We should not be building in coastal floodplains. Common sense is to allow for the changes that are likely to happen in the next 50 to 100 years. Coastal protection is incredibly expensive. It's actually not very expensive to avoid building somewhere. Avoid building there to avoid burdening future generations with the cost of maintaining these buildings and coastal protection. Newquay's dramatic clifftops are prime real estate, but in a first for Cornwall, the town has taken matters into its own hands. A new council policy means that any future development must now be sited at least 16.8 metres from the cliff edge. The cliffs here are disintegrating. The whole of that side there collapsed into the road and they had to restore it. They just sort of controlled it by putting concrete down the cracks. You'd be out of your mind to try and build. This doesn't stop people trying to do it, but the cliffs are so unstable that you actually look from the top, the falls are all the way along. We get them all the time, but it's just taken as normal now. But why are houses even being built on these crumbling cliff edges? Is it just blind denial? I think the local people are not in denial. They're horrified and incredibly supportive um, of, of what we're trying to do. I think the developers are because you can make millions from building on these fantastic sites. The problem was that the planning people have never operated with coastal change 
and everything they do is, is, a, is attached to a policy. So until you have your policy, you won't get planners looking at the cliff stability. We've declared the whole of our parish a coastal change management area, and then behind that, we've developed a whole series of policies in our neighbourhood plan, which says basically don't build on the edge. The second half of the coastal change management area is, well, what are you going to do when it falls? Do we move places back? Do we recite them? We have not done that half. There is a big question mark over what happens at that point. We don't think about people being climate refugees here in the UK, yet plans are already being made to abandon the town of Fairbourne in Wales because the local council there says it will be too expensive to protect it from climate impacts. Could we end up drawing back from coastal villages in Cornwall too? It's not a huge issue over the next 10, 20 years. But over the next 30 or 40, that's where things start to change. And that's where we're going to find that we've got housing or infrastructure or commercial properties that are just not sustainable. It's not just properties, it's, it's infrastructure, it's roads, it's rail, it's sewage works. Lots and lots of things are on the coast in places that won't be there in a few decades time or even a few years time in some cases. You try picturing a Cornish fishing village in 200 years time, it's going to look very different. Get used to seeing rooftops out to sea. Get used to seeing walls of properties that have been abandoned out in the low tide. It's going to happen. We should sort of curb our greed and take a step back and say, well, what if we would develop the coastline but stay maybe 50 or 100 metres away? That means we can let the coast erode if it needs to and it wouldn't cost us anything. We could still enjoy the coast, but not really tying the coast down and then having to face with problems later. I've been on an amazing journey around the Cornish coast. It never ceases to amaze me how spectacular it is. The coastline here has been changing for thousands of years, but what's really shocked me is the speed at which that change is happening now. We can't fight sea level rise, but that doesn't mean we should just stick our heads in the sand and give up. Some difficult questions have to be asked and solutions aren't going to happen overnight. So let's start talking now to give us time to adapt to the changes coming to the Cornish coast. If we don't, events may overtake us. I meant it as I said it, but I knew you wouldn't take it in. Thought we weathered the storm, but the walls were paper thin. I wanna stop this train, but I know it can't be undone. And I am bored in here, but you're waiting for the next one. And I remember how we built our love. The architecture was in vain We try to make it last but nothing does I never meant for all this pain 